Hello everyone, this is Jay Balakar from Compounding Capital Group. I hope everybody is doing fantastic. I hope everyone's gearing up for the holiday season. I wanted to do a quick video because this is our last newsletter for the year. Uh, hopefully you have enjoyed our newsletters and investor updates that we send out via email every month. Being the, being the last update, I thought of recording this quick video because the markets have changed drastically. We are clearly entering a new market cycle. The interest rates have gone up significantly. There's a lot of fear in the market. I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of open questions as well. Uh, in this video, I'm going to try to keep things simple, trying to stay away from a lot of the jargon like SOFR and LIBOR and, and try to keep things simple so everybody can follow along. But we will be using some basic real estate terminology like cap rates, NOI, uh, so on and so forth. A quick disclaimer, we are not economists. We rely on data that is published by other economists and other trusted sources like the Census Bureau, Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, also use data from uh, GLL, Marcus Millichap, CBRE, and firms like that who spend millions of dollars in uh, research and analytics. And we also rely on some industry experts like Neil Bawa, Ken McIlroy, uh, who've been in this business for quite some time. So having said that, let's dive right into the details. So let's first address the elephant in the room, the main question, rising interest rates. And what are our thoughts on that? So of course, the interest rates have risen very, very sharply in the last six months or so. Uh, just about six months, we were closing deals with local banks uh, at uh, three and a half, four, mid fours uh, percent rate of interest. And now we are looking at anywhere between a seven and a half to eight, eight and a half. So they have definitely gone up pretty quickly. And that's because of the Fed's increasing the Fed's funds rate and the, or the base interest rate, if you will. Now, why has that happened? So let's backtrack a little bit. When COVID happened, uh, late 2019, uh, early 2020, everybody thought that the economy, economy is, is going to take a downturn and we are going to enter a recession. And we would have, if uh, we would have done nothing about it, we would have seen a pretty massive recession, but the feds printed trillions of dollars and the government basically helicoptered $3 trillion of money and gave it to the consumers. And that has an, had an opposite effect. You know, actually there was more demand, the demand went up, consumer spending increased, uh, job growth was very positive. And the economy actually did pretty well um, post COVID and during COVID even. Uh, but now we're paying the price for it, right? Because $3 trillion were printed. That was money that came out of thin air. Thin air. Uh, we did something similar in 2008 where the money was handed over to bail out uh, companies like General Motors and Ford. Uh, th this time around, it was given directly to consumers. And of course, that's going to have an uh, impact on the consumer behavior and consumer spending patterns. So that created an artificial demand for goods and products. And at the same time, uh, due to COVID, supply chain and logistics was suffering. So there was this massive gap between supply and demand. The demand was way high, the supply was struggling. And that's why we were seeing, we we're seeing slowly prices of everything, labor, materials, everything just skyrocket. And inflation is just out of control. And because we were seeing close to 10%, you know, nine, nine, nine plus percent of inflation numbers, it was definitely, uh, you know, a warning sign. So to keep inflation under control, the feds had to increase the interest rates because that really is the only lever they have to bring inflation under control because inflation is really bad news. If, if you have uh, sustained periods of high inflation, that really causes a long-term damage to the economy. And that's something that we all do not want. So that's why feds have increased the interest rates very sharply in the last few months. And we are already seeing uh, that impact the inflation numbers. So with that being said, let's take a look at a few graphs and charts here. So as you can see my screen, this is essentially the historical rise in interest rates and then the drops that the feds have done uh, since the uh, mid to late 50s. So if you can see in, the, in 1955, the interest rates went up, 
they were dropped again, went up, dropped again. So this has happened about nine times in history. Every time the Feds increase the interest rates, uh, you know, the um, unemployment levels go up and the economy takes a downturn and then they decide, oh, it's enough's enough. We got to get the rates back down uh, to create more demand and uh, to boost up the economy again. So you see these uh, spikes up and down patterns uh, again and again and again. You see that spike again coming down and then in 2000s again in post uh, 2000, 2002 recession dot com. Uh, again, interest rates were brought down, uh, economy started to do well, the interest rates start to go back up again, and then 2008 recession happened, the interest rates came back down to again give economy a boost. Uh, 2010 onwards, the economy started to do better, and uh, up until 2020, 2022, the economy was doing really well. Now, before COVID, uh, they had started to increase the interest rates, but then COVID happened. And then uh, everybody was scared that we are going to hit a recession. So they brought the interest rates back down again to help the economy recover and stabilize. And then now, because inflation is crazy high, you see this very sharp increase in interest rates to bring that inflation number down. So not the first time. It's happened over and over again. And as the inflation numbers come down, we are pretty positive that the uh, interest rates are going to normalize. They probably may not come back down to zero, but they will definitely come down from the current levels. Now, if we look at inflation numbers, now, is this actually impacting inflation? Uh, we think so. If you look at May numbers, 8.58% uh, inflation, June, 9%, July, 8.52%. And as interest rates started to go up, you can see that inflation numbers are beginning to trend down. We are now 8, 7, 7.11. And once we get to 5 or below 5, we are in the safe zone again. And uh, once we are near the target inflation levels of 2 to 3%, that's when uh, you again have some, uh, uh, you know, a healthy economy. And that's when uh, it's projected that the Feds will start cutting down the interest rates again. But at the same time, I think it's also important to talk about supply and demand, you know? So uh, we, we are almost certain that we are entering a, a period of recession. Uh, 2023 uh, is, is going to be painful, let's be honest. But if we want to take a look at, okay, is this recession due to something that's broken in the economy itself, or is this an artificial uh, recession that's induced by the feds. This is actually an artificial recession induced by the feds uh, by kicking up the interest rates. The supply demand equation is, is still pretty healthy. So if you look at uh, this chart here from Moody's, uh, we see that what's the supply and demand for apartment complexes and multifamily in general. So if you look at 2022, the supply was actually lower than demand. So there was more demand than there was supply, uh, which, is, which is great news for us, right? In, in 2023, it's expected to level out. Uh, now, again, it was expected to level out, but with rising interest rates, a lot of construction projects have been paused. As the cost of capital has gone up, the cost of construction has gone up. So, uh, but still there's a very high demand and uh, the supply is barely there. Even in 2024 and moving forward, the supply and demand either barely match or in general, the demand actually outpaces the supply. So when you see a very good supply and demand equation, that's really a good sign. And that means the fundamentals of the economy are strong. Now, the yellow line, pay attention to that too, because that's rent growth, right? If you look at the rent growth, we see from 2020 to 2022, we see a crazy sharp hike in rents. Now, this is not normal, guys. The last few years, last couple of years, the double-digit rent growth that we have seen almost throughout America is not normal. And that is not something that we used to underwrite our deals either. We usually project 3 to 4% in rent growth year over year, which is kind of the usual normal stable levels. Now, because we saw this crazy high rent growth, in the last couple of years, again, 
we are now beginning to see that the rent growth is not as high. We are kind of paying the price for it too. The affordability is not there. The layoffs have already started and we can clearly see that people can no longer afford to pay those high rents and they can't absorb double digit rent growth every single year. So you can clearly see that's tapering down and some of the hottest markets where the rent growth was crazy high, like 24% in Tampa and 20 plus percent in Texas and Arizona markets, we are seeing that those markets are getting hit the highest and in some cases these markets are also seeing negative rent growth. Uh, in contrast, here in the Midwest where we like to invest, we are not seeing negative rent growth but we are definitely not seeing about 11, 12% rent growth that we see, saw in the last uh, two years. We're not seeing that now. It's more like 4%. So it's come back to really more normal uh, levels. So let me stop sharing my screen again here and let's get back to the video. All right, so we talked about interest rates increase. We talked about inflation. We talked about rent growth. Now, let's talk a little bit about cap rates. As the interest rates have gone up, what's happening is your mortgage payments on your properties have gone up. And as mortgage payments go up, your cash flow dries out. And as your cash flows dry out, you know, these properties no longer make sense. Let's say if this property XYZ was for sale for $10 million, and your payments at 5% rate of interest, let's say it was $50,000 a month, now uh, those uh, interest payments have almost doubled after the rates that have gone up. So after your payments have doubled, of course your cash flows have dried out, so the buyers are no longer willing to pay $10 million for the same property. By the end of the day, all of these commercial properties are investment properties, and the goal with these properties is to make money is to make returns for your investors. If you're having no cash flow or negative cash flow, no one's going to buy these properties, right? And so uh, the sellers, uh, sorry, the buyers are not willing to pay as much as the sellers wanted. And there's a little bit of a disconnect that we are seeing. The seller expectation is still a little bit on the higher side. And they were like, oh, I was getting $15 million for the same property six months ago. And what happened now? I'm, I'm not even getting offers for 10. So it's taking some time for them to realize that the market's changed, but they have to catch up. If they have to offload a property, they will have to offload it at a price that makes sense in current market conditions with current cost of capital, right? So that is something that we are seeing, which means the prices are coming down. Why? Because the cap rate, which is your denominator, is going up. So we are seeing some cap rate decompression. It's already started and there's nothing wrong with it. It's a part of the market cycle. Prices go up, come down, cap rates uh, uh, expand, and then they contract. It's just a part of market cycle, so it's nothing to be really scared of. Now, let's talk about risks. What risks uh, does all of this pose to real estate investing in general, and especially to our portfolio? Now, in, in this type of a market cycle, there's no asset class really that's doing well. Uh, tell me about your stock portfolio or, or your crypto portfolio. Uh, they have all lost a lot of value and we're gonna see some of that in real estate as well. But what does that mean in terms of risks and how should we be prepared to tackle these risks? So we know that because of a cap rate expansion or decompression, we are gonna see the values of properties go down. Because of uh, rising unemployment levels and layoffs, the rent growth is not going to be as strong as, at, 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 as it used to be. Uh, that is something that we already know. Now, how can we be prepared? One, if you have a floating interest loan, then you are at a little bit of a risk, especially if your liquidity levels are low and if you had not factored that into your underwriting. Your payments have gone up from 50K to, let's say, 100K, and if you didn't factor it in, if you had not bought a rate cap, then you can be in a little bit of a trouble. You would stop distributions. Uh, there's no money going out. Hopefully your property is at least sustaining from the income that you're making. So in these market conditions, having good debt that's locked in at a fixed rate of interest for a long time, at least five to seven years, 
is a plus and debt itself has become an asset. So any assumable loan that is locked in at three, four percent is now very lucrative. People want to buy those assets with those uh, assumable loans that are locked up for 10 years uh, agency uh, at three to four percent. Right. So in our case, all of our properties have been funded using local bank loans or credit unions, and they uh, they have been funded using uh, loan products that have been uh, locked up at steady interest rates of around four, mid fours to mid fives in that range. And they've been locked up for the next five to seven years. We only have like one property, a small property that has a bridge loan, but even that one is not on a floating interest rate. The interest rate's locked up for the next 18 months. So I think that really gives us some peace of mind, right? That our interest rate, at least for now, is not changing and it's fixed for the next five years. The other key aspect is liquidity. Uh, the market's changing, the cash flows are lower than expected as the, as, as the rent growth has gone down. So we wanna make sure that you have really good liquidity and reserves, which we do for every single one of our properties, we have really good reserves. And as sponsors and key principals on our team, we also have good reserves and liquidity to make sure that we are well positioned to tackle what's coming. Now, of course, nobody has a crystal ball to predict what's gonna happen. Uh, markets change in a blink of an eye. So, uh, you know, we can't predict what's gonna happen. The best we can do is to be prepared as much as possible to have good cash reserves liquidity so that we can tackle uh, any cash requirements that we have. Two, liquidity is so important and hence we are not overspending on anything. So fancy capex, you know, things, that that's gonna make your property look really swanky, but it's not solving a purpose. We are cutting out anything like that, right? Basic upgrades. We, we gotta go for the basic stuff that we need, fix all the deferred maintenance. We are not stopping CapEx. CapEx is required, and I'm, I'm gonna touch upon business plan here in a little bit, but overspending money right now uh, is, in our opinion, big mistake. We have also slowed down acquisitions. Right now, interest rates are going up, cap rates are you know, uh, expanding, and we have not really reached the bottom of this cycle yet. And buying any property right now, even at a fair market value, is like catching a fallen knife, and you don't wanna do that. At the same time, we have not stopped underwriting deals. If we absolutely find a home run, we'll probably still go for it, uh, because the upcoming months are gonna present really, really good buying opportunities. Uh, as Warren Buffet says, and it's a common investment philosophy, is to buy low and sell high. And we really think those opportunities are coming very soon here. But we are not being aggressive in terms of acquisitions. Uh, we are not going after those singles or doubles. Right now, we are only looking for home runs, and if it's not a home run, we are just waiting it out. It's a good time to be focusing on our systems. So we are uh, beefing up our DTS system, we are beefing up our marketing machine, and really working on the business than trying to go after more deals. It's really not the time to be greedy. We firmly believe that, our mentors believe that, people we respect in this space believe that, and, and that's what we are gonna do. Uh, now, uh, one of the other things that I wanna address is refis. Uh, a lot of times when we present an investment property, or opportunity, we talk about refis and return off at least portion of the capital. Now, now that the interest rates have gone up from like 4% to 8.5%, 9%, it no longer really makes sense, even if you have built good amount of equity after increasing the value of the property through renovations and increasing the rents and through other ways by increasing the rents and overall NOI, you've got a good amount of equity in the deal or in the property but it makes absolutely no sense to refi out of a debt that's fixed for five years at 4% and now getting into debt at eight and a half, nine percent It's stupidity. So we are not gonna do refi. And this is why we always, when we uh, present an opportunity to you guys, we say that these are projected terms. Refi is projected, it's not promised, right? So if market has clearly changed, 
And that's why we are no longer going to do any refis in the upcoming months until the interest rates stabilize again and come back down to the normal levels of maybe around 5 to 5.5 percent in the upcoming months, in maybe about 18 to 24 months. So no refis, but that's not necessarily a bad news. You're not losing your capital. It's still kind of stuck in the property. You're building equity in the property, but you're not losing your property. Speaking of which, let's talk about capital preservation. Now, if you had $50,000 invested in the stock market or crypto, uh, you probably lost a big chunk of that by now. And, uh, you know, and uh, with what happened with FTX, a lot of people lost their money altogether. Similarly, if you have invested any money in your stocks and in the upcoming market cycle, if some of those companies don't make it, you've essentially lost that money. With real estate, your money is tied to a physical asset. So at least at the very least, uh, you know, the capital preservation uh, or chances of capital preservation are very high, you know. So uh, unless the property completely disappears, which won't happen, you still have insurance, uh, you at least preserve your capital, it's never going to disappear. The key thing is we ride out the, this market cycle and to ride this market cycle out, we have to be liquid enough, we have to have enough reserves. Uh, I, at the same time, I want to set the right in, uh, expectations with you all. If things really get nasty, distributions may stop. You know, the worst come worst case, there could be a capital call. We really, really want to stay away from capital call. That's not what we want to do. We want to continue to distribute. We want to continue to make our target projections. But at least the capital that we have invested in these properties, it's being preserved. And as we are executing on the market, uh, on the business plan, NOI growth, your equity is slowly and steadily growing. But it's probably not the best time to either refi or exit uh, from the market as we are trending downwards in, in this market cycle. And then uh, also, in, in general, uh, a comment I want to make about this recession is that this recession is artificially induced. There is nothing fundamentally that's broken in this economy. The supply and demand equation looks pretty solid. Uh, unlike 2008, where the failure happened in terms of the lending practices and uh, even a Joe Schmo was getting a million dollar loan to buy a property uh, on a $40,000 a year income, that's not happening today. The banks are extremely conservative. Some of the banks have stopped lending altogether. And even the banks who are lending want at least 25 to 30% down payment, so no one's over leveraged. So it's a completely different situation now. The recession that we are about to see in the market is induced by the rising interest rates from the feds. And as the interest rates go down, it is very well projected that the market will kick back up in high gear and we'll start seeing capital compression again, start seeing the property values go up again, so on and so forth. So really, I think all of these things were the key points that I wanted to touch upon in this video. I hope this answered a lot of the questions that you guys had. If there were any questions you guys have that we were not able to address in this video, we are only a phone call away. You can use our Calendly link uh, to set up a one-on-one -on -one call with us, and we are happy to answer or address your questions to the best of our abilities. If we don't have an answer, we promise you we will reach out to the experts we know, to the people we know, and get you those answers. So please don't hesitate to reach out. I really hope this was helpful. Uh, have a great holiday season. Merry Christmas. Enjoy the new year. And goodbye for now. We'll see you in the new year. Bye-bye.